Hello, my name is Adam Waters. I am the lead pastor of Grace Bible Church in Elmhurst, Illinois, and I'd like to welcome you as we begin our series of Daily Dose of the Psalms. Uh, as I go through chapters of the Psalms, sections of individual chapters, as we dive into God's Word to see what He has to say to us, uh, particularly during this uh, crisis that we find ourselves in as a world, as a nation, and as a community. And so if you're not a member of Grace Bible Church, I would say welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I hope that God, God blesses you through this. I hope that um, God speaks to you through his word during this time. If you are a member of Grace Bible Church, welcome. I'm glad you're here, brother or sister. I'm glad that you've tuned in and you've taken a moment out of your day um, to read God's word with me, to try to understand what it means uh, more deeply and understand how God would have it uh, be applied to our lives at this time. So uh, I'm going to be starting in Psalm 1. It seemed like the most apropos place to start. And so if you have your Bible, I would recommend or I would uh, encourage you to get it out. It's always important to be our, in God's Word ourselves. If you don't have your Bible or you're listening while you're driving or whatever, uh, that's okay too. Uh, I will read the psalm and, and, and just so listen carefully to what it is that God has to say. Um, why don't I pray for us that God would reveal His will to us in His Word Father, thank you for today. Thank you for um, another opportunity to, to, to be alive, to read your word, and to uh, learn who you are. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this time together uh, as we're connected virtually, um, perhaps around the world. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, teach us what it means to be a church, one church and one body that uh, shares in the fellowship of the Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us learn what it is that you would have us do uh, today, how we would apply your word today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You know, this is one of my favorite psalms as I uh, read through uh, God's word. And I got to say that it starts out uh, very positively for me. The very first word is the Hebrew word asharei. Now, most translations will translate this as blessed, um, with the idea that a person is happy, with the idea that a person is feeling fulfilled and peaceful, and that is indeed true. But what I think is important to note in this passage, in this line, this word, is not the typical Hebrew word for blessed. Okay, this word means something more of an emotional happiness. So God is really saying that blessed, that happy is the person who does or does not do what he has to say uh, in this psalm. And so that's a promise right off the beginning, that, or at the beginning, that we can take to heart, is that God has promises for our happiness. I think sometimes well-meaning Christians will say it doesn't matter about our happiness. It matters that we're obedient at the expense of our happiness. And I would push back and I would say that when we are truly trusting God and we're being obedient to his word, happiness is is the natural consequence. It's something more like joy. It's a deep emotional resonance with God's will and who God is. And so it says, uh, happy is the person, is the man, is what ESV says. Now in the scripture, it does say the word ish, which is the word uh, man. But I want you to know that in this passage and in all passages of scripture, where it says man, it's okay uh, to bring that to bear upon your own life if you're a woman that this promise is certainly not limited uh, to men alone, but as, as a child of God, as a daughter of the king, you too can uh, take this promise to heart. You too can live by the promises of Psalm 1. It says, happy is the man or happy is the person who, you know, this relative pronoun qualifies the previous clause. So it tells us about the happy person. Now, I want you to notice that there's three things that the happy person rejects and then two things that the happy person embraces. So the first thing, the first behavior attitude that the happy person rejects is the advice of those who are not 
whose heart is not in line with God's will. The Bible says that who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, someone who does not ask, someone who doesn't know the Lord, uh, what they should do. Someone who is not walking in the will of God does not have the same worldview or same understanding of what it means to live for God and God alone. And so a happy person will not take advice. In fact, they will reject the advice of somebody who does not know God. Now, this certainly doesn't mean that we shouldn't be listening to subject matter experts who may not be following the Lord or that there isn't a certain amount of knowledge in the technical realm that we do need to take for granted. What I do believe, though, is that when it comes to bear on our moral and ethical obligation before God, what it is that we're supposed to do morally, we should not be taking advice from those who do not know the Lord, those who cannot point us back to Christ. The second thing that it says that we, the happy person rejects is a happy person rejects the idea of cozying up to sinners. Now, before I was a pastor, uh, I was a tradesman. I was actually a plumber, and I know what it was like to be in the shop in the morning or in the afternoon before work or after and being caught up in the banter and being caught up in um, the sort of locker room talk that goes with, with um having a bunch of guys in a trade all in the same place at the same time. Um, I know what that's like, and I know how easy it is to be able to fall into that. But the Bible says that the happy man is one who rejects doing so. The happy man, thirdly, doesn't also rejects uh, being comfortable around those who constantly doubt or reject what is good out of skepticism. Now, we're all called to be as witnesses of the, of the gospel. We're called to go to those people who, who do not know the Lord and to give a reasoned defense um, of what it is we believe and why we believe it. So it's not that interacting with skeptics is necessarily wrong. It's interacting with people who are constantly skeptical, those who constantly doubt or reject what is good that's dangerous. You know, the, the saying goes that if you sit in a barbershop long enough, you're eventually going to get a haircut. And the same thing is true, and I, I think I resonate with that in my own life. Perhaps you do too. You might be around people who are always negative, who have a difficult time seeing the positive side of things, and it's very easy to begin thinking like them, to begin seeing the negatives instead of seeing the positives. So God cautions us that we should reject uh, sort of being comfortable around those people. Now note the progression. This is something that's pretty interesting, and I think it's intentional by the psalmist when he writes. What it says is, is it says that those who do not walk, those who do not stand, and those who do not sit are the ones who are happy. So there's this progression of movement. Someone walking along the way, and then stopping to sort of listen and see what's going on, and then finally joining the crowd and sitting. Um, I think it's important on our walk uh, with the Lord that we do not stop sort of to see the sights as it were. We do not stop and, and get pulled left or right into the things of this world. We stay focused on our goal. That's the heavenly city. And we continue to walk for it. We continue to walk to it. Um, I know, like I said, in the mornings when I was uh, going to work as a plumber, I would uh, walk in and I would hear the guys talking. And in the beginning, it was easy for me to say, okay, they're doing their thing. Uh, they're doing what they know. I'm going to stay and I'm going to um, try to really uh, take this time to pray, to focus on the Lord, to prepare my heart for the day. But you know what? Over time, it didn't take long for me to be in the room with them. Maybe not laughing, maybe not encouraging them, but certainly listening. And then you know what happened? In no time, I was actually joining in with them. And the Lord pointed that out to me. He said, look what has just happened. And when I read this passage, uh, this psalm, around that time in my life, it really, I was cut to the heart because I realized uh, this is exactly what I was doing. This is exactly what the Lord didn't want me to do. He wanted me to be happy and to be focused on him. And so this second verse talks about what is it that the happy man is actually accepting, okay? The second verse says, but his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You know, a person who seeks happiness is one who is constantly in love with God's word. Now, I don't know about you, there are times in my life when, even as a pastor, I had a difficult time reading God's word. It wasn't that, um, that I didn't believe it, or was it that I didn't like it, it's just I sort of had an apathy about it. And you know what? I felt a sense of unhappiness in my soul. And it was no sooner than I sort of delved back in intentionally into God's word and began to think about God's word and to bathe my mind in God's word that I began to be happy again. 
I began to see the joy of my salvation, to live for God and to see what it meant uh, to live a life that is good, clean, and pure, one that seeks after that which is awesome, that is God, instead of one, uh, a life that seeks after the things of this world which are perishing. Um, So how is it that you uh, can delight in God's word and meditate on it day and night? Well, I'd say, first of all, do what you're doing now. We're in God's word together and we're studying to see what he has to say. We're reading and allowing God's word not only to be interpreted by us, but to interpret us in our hearts, to sort of shine a light in a mirror on what's happening in our souls. This is so important for us as we walk with the Lord. The other thing I think is, is that there, there are a couple of things, actually. One is we can be memorizing God's word. Um, my wife frequently carries flashcards with her, and in her off times when she's sitting, which admittedly is not very often these days, um, but she goes through her flashcards and she continues to memorize scripture that have a special meaning to her heart, that really address the things that she struggles with uh, from day to day. This is an exercise that I would encourage all of us to do. Listening to Christian music, listening to people who, who preach or to do devotionals like this, things that will constantly point you back to God's word are important. And then thinking about it deeply, more than just the surface, but what is it that this that God's word or God himself, the author behind his word, is actually saying to me? What is it that God wants me to think, believe, and do? Um, it's really uh, what God wants us to do more than just have a superficial knowledge of what his word says. Verse 3 goes on to say uh, about the happy person, it says that he or she is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Listen to this promise. And all that it does and all that he or she does prospers. That's quite a promise. Everything that we do prospers. Let's talk about that. So in this passage, this this next part, verse 3, talks about sort of what are the results of a life lived according to the guidance in, in, in verse 1 and 2, in, in sort of rejecting that which is bad and accepting that which is good. Well, the psalmist says that the person who does that is like a tree planted by streams of running water. A couple of things about this, I think, is that one is that a tree planted near running water has its roots in a source of life that is always there, that is constantly running, one that seemingly is never ending. It's always being replenished and made new again and again. Right behind our house, we have a creek. In fact, right out there, just a few feet, we have a, a creek that, in fact, right now, after the precipitation's run in pretty pretty quickly, and it's just a blessing to me to be able to get up in the morning and look out the window and see this water just bringing life to the trees um, around my house, and knowing that those roots are deep in that source of nourishment um, is really quite remarkable. And this is the picture that that the um, that the psalmist is trying to bring out. Now, especially written, uh, the idea is that this was written in the uh, land of Israel, which is not known for, shall I say, its lush rainforests. It is a very arid land, so water has deep meaning. Uh, water is the idea of life. Where there's water, there's life. And so someone who, who trusts in the Lord, meditates on his word, shuns the things uh, that God's asking him to reject of this world, can, can rely on a source of life. The Hebrew word here for plant actually can be translated transplant. The word is shatal, for those who might be interested. So it could be saying that when we trust in the Lord, when we're we're rejecting those things and when we're accepting him and his word, it could be that God will transplant us from our current situation of dryness and of lack of prosperity into a place of richness and life and and, um, goodness and, and, like I said, blessing. So... I guess the question is to for you today, what I'm thinking about my own life actually is, are where are my roots? Where are your roots? Are your roots deep into God's word? Are they, uh, are they stretching down as far into God that they can possibly go? Or are the roots, the thing that brings you life, the source of your nourishment found in the things of this world, in the people, places, and things that ultimately, in the end, will one day perish. The only thing that really matters in this life is God and our walk with him. As we seek after God, as we seek to be nourished in God, everything else will fall into place. 
So even during this crisis, even during this time, we can be assured and be and rest on the promise of God that if we don't link ourselves to the things of this world, if we don't worry about what's really going on here and we invest ourselves at this moment in this time into God and God's will for our lives, we will find happiness. We will find prosperity regardless of what happens uh, or what is going on around us. Now, as the psalmist relates the happy person to a tree, there's a couple of things in in this uh, verse three that he points out. One is that they bear fruit. You know, as roots are deeply rooted, so into the ground, the more deeply they are rooted, the better the fruit. I have a friend who um, who uh, is from Mexico, and he had almond trees on his father's ranch, and they would not produce almonds. And so there was this old man who lived, you know, a couple miles away, that, who was known to be quite the the agricultural uh, expert. And so they invited him, and he said, uh, "Well, there's not enough." nutrients in the soil or surrounding the actual tree. And so what he suggested was is that you put a, a fence around the tree and you put some goats in there and you allow the goats to do what they do, eat and drop and fertilize the soil. And as those nutrients got down into the roots and nourished the roots, the almond tree began to produce almonds. So the fertilizer that was uh, allowed to seep down into those little tiny roots that are that are just begging to be fed, um, when that happens, then fruit will happen automatically. And this is the same idea here as as the tree, as this this person who's who's delighting in God's word, the happy person um, is seeking to find nutrients in God's word. They will bear fruit. Now, that, that fruit is what we would call fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, page, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. The idea is, is that when we're rooted in God, we will produce visible, tangible results in our behavior. The other thing about this happy person is that it, as compared to the tree, it says that uh, their leaf does not wither. They won't go through the same dry times as people who uh, are rooted in the things of this world, which is really, um, like I said, uh, perishing. Only God can supply to us what we really need to live. Only God can supply to us that which nourishes our souls. And as we continue in God's word, we can be assured that he will not cut that life off, that we again and again can go back to the source of his goodness in the witness to his character, God's word, and we too can be nourished and full of life. And then finally, it says the person who does this prospers in everything. You know, that word prosperity sometimes has a negative connotation in some Christian circles because the belief is, is that um, we were not saved to have everything go great, which is true. Uh, the moment we are saved, the moment God saves us and makes us a child of his and who are adopted, we in some ways can expect there to be um, suffering. It's part of what it means to reject yourself and to reject your desires and for you to seek after the desire of God for your life, rejecting your own will and accepting God's will. And so there is suffering that goes with that dying to self. However, when we align ourselves with God's will, when we trust God in his word, when we seek after what he wants for our life, it changes what we want. So in fact, the things that we seek to do turn out to be, in the end, the thing that God would seek for us. And God will prosper those things. God will bless the things that he wants us to do when we're obedient to him. Psalm 4 says this, it says, The wicked are not so, but they're like chaff which the wind drives away. Now, some of you might not know what chaff is, but chaff is the outer thin sort of husk on a grain. Okay, so like on a, imagine wheat. Um, if you took raw wheat and you pulled it out, it would be the little kernel of, of wheat inside of an outer skin. And if you rub that skin off or you break that skin off, uh, that skin is useless, that chaff is useless. And so what they would do in the ancient Near East during this time and other places is uh, they would harvest the wheat, let it dry, and then beat it against the ground to break the husk off, the chaff off. And then they would, with a fork, toss it up into the air. And the wind would blow the chaff away, but the, root, the heavier grain of wheat would fall to the ground. And so when we read this scripture, this is exactly what the psalmist is saying, that people who do not know the Lord 
those who, who do not know or who are living according to God's will are like. They're like chaff. They have no weight. They have no substance. Any little thing um, blows them. The word here in uh, blows them away. The word here is nagaf. Okay, nagaf carries this sense of sort of destruction along with this idea of of the wind of blowing away. So this idea of that that it, it not only blows them away but it, it purposely blows them away. So the word in ESV here is the word drives drives them away. It's not a gentle blowing. It has control over them. And so during this crisis, those who are not rooted in God's word, those who are not following according to God's will, uh, they are being blown to and fro, um, driven to and fro by every wind of change, by every new myth, every new rumor, every new fear. But we do not have that. As children of God, we can trust that our Father will protect us. We're rooted in him. And he desires that we root ourselves in him more and more each day so that we can stand firm even in these trying times. Verse 5 now turns to a future promise. It says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You know, those who it says will not stand in the judgment is looking ahead to judgment day when God calls everybody before him and they stand before Jesus Christ and they give an account of their life. Those who have not trusted the Lord and those who have not leaned on him have not sought to drive their roots deep and uh, into the life that is found in Jesus are not going to be able to stand, are not going to be able to have a standing for vindication. They will not be proven right. And that's a scary thought. As we go through this time, this is a time when many people in the world are questioning their own existence. And we should be there as children of God uh, to, to point them to Jesus Christ, the true Savior of the world. Maybe you're watching now and you are an unbeliever. Maybe you have not yet trusted in the Lord. And I would encourage you, today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day that God is calling you, that Jesus is calling you to be one of his children, to be part of his family. And so would you do that today? Would you cry out to God in your heart and say, Lord, save me. I trust you, Jesus. This is the day that you can do that. You know, those not only will not stand in the judgment, but it says that nor will sinners sit in the congregation of the righteous. That is, they will not have an inheritance that has been promised to the children of God. They will not be part of that. They will be left out of the eternal blessing that God has promised to those who love him. And I don't want that for you. If you're not yet trusted the Lord, if you're not a child of God, I don't want you to be left out from all of the good things that God has for you today. So would you trust him? Would you cry out to him today? Finally, in verse 6, it says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And this verse gives the reason for the wicked's exclusion from the congregation of the righteous. It says that God knows the way of the righteous. The word here, yada, is this, this sort of idea of, of intimate knowledge that God sees. He is watching the way of the righteous. He approves of the way of the righteous. He sees the way and struggle for those who are seeking after him. He gives approval to their efforts and blesses them with success. So as the, the, those who are seeking after God walk along the path, as they're on their way, God blesses them. He gives them success. But the path of the wicked does not lead to prosperity, but to death. You know, interestingly here, the psalmist, I think, does not say that the wicked will perish. If you look at it, it says the way of the wicked will perish. The way of the wicked will perish. But it's underscoring that the way of uh, the manner in which they're living, the thing after which they're seeking, in the end, is futile. I think of Ecclesiastes, where it talks about uh, everything in life being vanity, vanity of vanities, chasing after a wind. In the end, when we're not loving God and seeking after his will, but when we're seeking after that which pleases us, that which we believe will bring us security and a sense of okayness, um, in the end will turn out to be futile. And so I encourage you today, as you go, as you are uh, living life, as you might be in your home with your family and your loved ones, uh, just continue to take uh, stock of your life and to, to, and to seek to move your roots deeper, to grow deeper into who God is. The bottom line of this whole psalm is that God promises blessing for those who seek after him and reject the things of this world. 
So as we are dealing with the COVID crisis, reject the fear that so many are having that you might be tempted to have. Reject the uncertainty and embrace the fact that God loves you, that you can trust him, that he is in control, and that uh, you have solid ground from which to stand. And that is in God's word. And so God bless you. I hope you have a great day. I will see you tomorrow with a new psalm. Don't know if it'll go this long, uh, but I'm encouraged uh, by your tuning in. God bless you and have a great day. Bye-bye.